First, I want to, on behalf of the board, Alexander, everyone, this is since first opportunity to, to experience conscious capitalism, so let's just welcome her officially. Thank you, thank you. You and know I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Yeah, yeah, I'm inviting I told, myself back. I already told her she has to join, right? That I was telling her what an awesome, awesome group this is, and, and um, it, there's so much good in this room. And so I want us to start just quickly by giving Sin an opportunity to tell her story, because I, I was sitting yesterday thinking, uh, we always talk about words that inspire us here and the optimism, but actually today we're probably, the word that came to my mind, Carrie, when you first started was vulnerability. Mm. Because for us to truly share with you what we do uh, every day is that we have to be vulnerable and ask you to take that, that journey with us. So Sint, just take a few minutes and tell this group about your life. First of all, thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Hattie, for telling me about this wonderful organization and these wonderful people. Uh, you know you did a good job to get me out here on uh, the day that we are getting ready to tip off the season. Yeah, right, okay. right. Uh, so I am going to be on a plane literally as soon as I'm done. I am running out because we got to tip off the season tonight. We have our first preseason game uh, in Dallas. Uh, but what you told me I've already experienced. Uh, just listening to James. James, thank you so much for sharing uh, with us. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm ready to take out a purple crayon to go with this purple St. John top. Um, and I'm wearing purple, of course, because of uh, uh, domestic violence, yeah. and which is a part of my story. And I, uh, my parents, uh, I was actually born in Birmingham, Alabama, if you know your civil rights history. Uh, you know there was a church that was bombed in Birmingham, the 16th Street Baptist uh, Church uh, in September of 1963. That was my mother's church. And uh, she left there three years prior to that uh, when I was three months old because my parents didn't want their kids growing up in the Jim Crow segregated South. Uh, they had experienced a lot already uh, in 1960. And so we landed in the San Francisco Bay Area and I uh, uh, landed in the Easter Hill Public Housing Projects. Uh, just about everything you can think of uh, that bad and good in a housing project, I saw it and experienced it. Uh, when I was 11 years old, Hattie, as you know, I saw my father shoot a man in the head in self-defense. Actually, not really in self-defense, it was more in defense of me because all this commotion broke out at our house and uh, the 17-year-old a young man came to wreak havoc on our family. My mom had the six kids in the back room. I was quiet, I know it's hard to believe, uh, Hattie, but I was quiet back then, and, but inquisitive. And I just wanted to know what this commotion was about at the front door, so I sneaked up the hallway, and that's when my father realized I was no longer in the back room with my five brothers and sisters, but in the potential pathway of a bullet, because the young man pointed down to my father's right side, I can still see that silver pistol, and he pointed it at me. And my father shot back to defend his family. Uh, fortunately, it was not fatal, uh, but you can imagine what broke out uh, in our neighborhood and the chaos. And so we had to, the six kids had to be sequestered in the house for safety purposes. But I cried, cried, cried because I wanted to go to school. Uh, because I had already been taught at 11 years old that school was, even though we didn't have money, we were poor, violence was breaking out, we were the victims of domestic violence, my mother was getting beat up all the time, she instilled in us that education was our ticket out. And she put two books in my hand, a math book in one hand and a Bible in the other, and said, you keep your head in these two books, you'll get out. And at the time, I didn't know what out meant, I didn't know how poor we were, I didn't know that we were living in poverty, I didn't know all that. Um, but I know she kept us focused. And so uh, after that, so a, a uniformed police officer took me to school in the seventh grade. And he would show up to my house in his uniform and he would uh, get on the bus with me or he would put me in his police car because the whole goal was to get me to school because that was kind of my hiding place. And so even to this day, when I got this job and they put security on me and gave me all this detail and tried to explain it to me, I told them I've had I had Secret Service when I was 11 years old, okay? <laughs> I had a police officer taking me to school, I got this. Uh, which is why I have truly have uh, a love for uh, the people who protected the service. 
And so then four years later, uh, 15, my parents got a divorce. As you know, he left us, my dad left us with one mattress in a four bedroom deluxe unit in the projects. Uh, he took everything. And uh, I, I can hear my mother to this day saying, because you know, we were upset as teenagers, I was getting ready to start school as a junior in high school. I had a big brace on my nose from when my father had broken my nose that summer uh, because we had to flee our house uh, for the entire summer because of violence. And my mother's prayer was that we would make it back home before school started because education was everything. Uh, so a few days before school started, we made it back home. I was a junior in high school, uh, getting ready to be head cheerleader, and we had nothing. And my mother just told us to be quiet. So it was quiet, just like it is right now. And she said, all I want is peace of mind. God will provide. He'll take care of us. And we we're like, we're all of our trophies, our school clothes. Like, he needs to be taking care of us, like, right now. Like, <laughs> like where's our stuff? I mean, I'm 15 years old. I'm a teenager, right? I'm getting ready to be head truly. And I remember going back to school. Uh, with that brace on my nose, and I had three teachers and a principal. I love, love, love educators. Three teachers and a principal to embrace me, to find out what was going on in our family, and the rest was history. They got me involved in all kind of activities, uh, leadership roles, and fortunately I ended up graduating at the top of my school district, and got five full scholarships to the college of my choice. I chose the University of California at Berkeley, uh, not because it's the number one public institution in the world. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but because it was 15 minutes away from home. Right. And with all the violence and everything going on, I got a, one, uh, one, of, uh, one of the companies, God bless these wonderful companies, uh, like yours, they gave me uh, a car. Uh, and so I gave that to my mom and uh, had my four years at uh, Berkeley, put my boyfriend on hold for four years because I needed to focus and people were pouring in my life, people who didn't even look like me, who looked like a lot of you poured into my life and just said, you're going to do great things. And they exposed me to all kinds of things. They gave me four words to live by, dream, focus, pray, and act. And that's what I did. I got to school, I focused, and I ended up getting 13 job offers coming out of school. I was the first African-American cheerleader at Berkeley, the first black in my sorority. I mean, all these firsts, and I didn't know I was first. I just did what people were telling me to do, and I was just kind of trying to live life. and. Um, Ended up with 13 job offers and chose AT&T. Chose the phone company coming out of school and had 15 fabulous jobs uh, at AT&T and retired in 2017. And then the rest is history. And the biggest capitalist in the country sought you out to run the Mavericks. <laughs> yes, and so, and so don't judge me. Don't judge me. Okay, don't judge me. I didn't know Mark Cuban when he called me. Okay, I didn't, and people laugh. I'm like, well, he didn't know me. Okay, so <laughs> I didn't know him, and he didn't know me, right? <laughs> and so, okay, so so it's February 21st. Uh, we're like totally off script. But I anyway, didn't matter. It's Just February go. 21st, 2018. So I had retired after 36 years with AT&T. I uh, said I was going to take a year off, but I didn't get a chance to do that because the Dow Chemical Company wanted me to help them uh, basically transform their culture and they wanted to really get a people strategy in place and really be about the people. Really, they wanted to start really doing good. And so I basically took three months off, started helping them. And so it's February 21st, and I remember that day because these teenagers were protesting in Parkland, Florida because of gun violence and all that. But it was also the same day that Reverend Dr. Billy Graham had passed away, who had a big impact in my life. I grew up uh, listening to him. He was just kind of part of like our household. And so I remember that morning I wrote a blog post called Impact, and I had the ACT capitalized. Like, okay, there's some action I'm supposed to take in my life now. I'm retired, I'm watching these teenagers, and then this 99-year-old, and I'm, I'm, I'm literally smack dab age-wise in the middle. And I'm thinking, these people are impacting me. What kind of impact am I gonna have now? I know the impact I had at AT&T, and I know what people said, but truly in my heart, what's my impact right now? And so I wrote the blog post that morning, let it go. I'm on a call with my client on one phone and my other phone is, the text messages are just going off. And I have four kids and two of them were in college. I told my husband, I just literally handed him the phone. I said, one of the kids need money transferred. 
because, I mean, that's what they, text that's what they do. I mean, that's what they text. And I had gotten to a point, I'm a busy woman. I told my kids, I don't need the backstory. I don't need all that. Just send them out. Okay, and then we square it all up later. I'll figure out what's going on. So I really thought, because the messages were just coming in, that truly it was one of my kids in college needing money. So my husband came back, and he said, um, it's not one of the kids. And the guy who's texting you doesn't need money. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. He, he said, it's Mark Cuban. And I looked at him, and I said, who is that? Mark Cuban. And he says, oh, wife, you never know the stuff you need to do. He's Mark Cuban. So he starts telling okay. me who it is. And I'm like, OK. So I finally call him back. So, no, so he called my son and said, tell your mom to call this guy back, right? Tell him. And he goes, mom, you know who that is? So anyway, so they told me who it was. So I called him back. And he wanted to meet with me at 2 o'clock. And so I told him I couldn't meet with him at 2 o'clock because I had a mammogram. Yes, ladies, that's what I told Mark Cuban. <laughs> and so <laughs> and I told him I'm a cancer survivor. I'm a cancer survivor. Um, and in 2010, as you know, Hattie, uh, I had a, a surgeon uh, tell me, um, basically an oncologist told me I had six months to live. And so uh, from colon cancer because I didn't take care of my business and didn't get a colonoscopy when I was supposed to get it. And so I told him, I said, I have a mammogram. I cannot meet with you at 2 o'clock. Uh, sounds like you're having a crisis. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you want me to come meet me? No, you don't need to show up at the mammogram, OK? <laughs> uh, and that's not what he was saying. He was trying to make it easy for me to see, see him. him. Yeah. And so we finally uh, connected. And um, it was a wonderful 55-minute conversation with him. Uh, telling me that he wanted me to be the CEO because of what was happening in his organization. And he had been focused on basketball and not the business side of it. And so he went on and on and on. And I still wasn't convinced what, after I spent time with him. And when I walked out of his office, two women stopped me to tell me their stories. And when they told me their stories, that's when mm -hmm. I really started thinking, oh my goodness. I told Mark, I said, let me go home and pray about it. Uh, because I need to just get some direction on what I'm supposed to be doing in my life now because I thought I was getting ready to go and either be a college president or head up a children's organization around adoption and now we're talking basketball like <laughs> where'd that come from yeah okay <laughs> and so I said I got to figure out what's going on here and when these women stopped me I just thought oh I got to really think about this mm -hmm. and then I got in the car and that blog post came back to me that I had written that very morning yep. impact mm -hmm. This is an opportunity for impact. And so I went home, prayed about it, and the rest is history. And we've been changing the culture and all that. And we tip off tonight. <laughs> so now I run a basketball team. It's cool. <laughs> so, so I approached Scent when I went to the T.D. Jakes Foundation. And, and um, tell me why you joined the board of the T.D. Jakes Foundation. Ooh, it's back to impact. It's back to impact. We had. Um, we all know what, what we went through in 2020 with the double pandemic, a pandemic of uh, a health pandemic, but also um, a pandemic around awareness of uh, social injustice. And so we had done our thing at the, we had done our thing at the MAVs with MAVs Take Action and our whole agenda around trying to have an impact in the community, uh, trying to take our resources and our platform to do well. And so you and I connected mm -hmm. on the STEAM Academy uh, really an opportunity. I know that the foundation's focused on children right. and really kind of helping us get the pipeline mm -hmm. ready and giving these kids what they need so that, of course, we can all benefit. So it's more than just a good thing to do. We benefit from that. And so after you kind of wrote me into STEM and all of that, I thought, wow, uh, this foundation is actually doing the work that I think needs to be done. Um, the, Bishop, of course, I know Bishop Jakes as a, a preacher. I mean, I grew up with him, okay? Uh, but I didn't know him as the visionary and the voice that he is around bringing communities together and doing things that really impact my business in terms of educating the youth, uh, reaching into communities, uh, the economic uh, investment that he's making. Um, I was stunned, actually, by mm -hmm. what I was hearing. They probably don't even know who, do you, how many of you know who T.D. Jakes is? Oh, few people, okay, good. See, I knew, I didn't know Mark Cuban, but I knew T.D. <laughs> Jakes, okay? You know what? I knew Bishop Jakes. Uh, 
Joe, that I have a picture from Monday, right before we came down here. So um, T.D. Jakes is probably one of the biggest voices globally, locally. If you have a business, some of your people do business in, in his, in, just somewhere around mm. what he does. This was Monday. We launched a partnership in Dallas with the Dallas Summer Musicals. Uh, we're, we're all about science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, and getting to the poorest communities. And so this was um, the um, uh, executive from Frito-Lay, because they're our partner, and they came in, and it's uh, the head of uh, the Dallas Independent School District, and of course, Allison, who is our uh, chief development officer, and then ID Tech, which is an, a technology provider. And the goal is to take 3,400 students who've never seen a Broadway musical and take them not only to see Hamilton at the front of the stage, but also to understand the jobs behind the stage. So it's, it's all impact work that we do every day. And we can't do that work without corporations yes. like the Mavericks. And so that's, that's why I was so excited to have Sid as a part of our board yes. and a, a part of what we do. Because every day when we get up trying to make a difference, we depend on people to help us do that. Thank you. And the, and the great connection for us is uh, we have our Mavs Take Action Plan. And action stand, it's, it's what we launched last June, uh, June of 2020. Uh, after we had a big community courageous conversation because we decided, you know, we were having all these conversations internally and we said we need to have a community conversation and we need to have it uh, in a socially distant, you know, safe way. But we are the Dallas Mavericks. We are a professional basketball team. We convene people for a living. And so here's an opportunity to convene people in a safe way and have this dialogue. So after we had this convening, we ended up uh, coming up with something called Mavs Take Action. And it was our way of saying, we're going to take action uh, to make sure that we, we are doing our part to create a more diverse, equitable, and just society. And so we're gonna use our platform for that. And so action stands for advocacy, communication, training, investment, outreach, and noise. And the noise piece is around the arts. How can we invest more, invest in our children, invest more in the arts world, because that is, part of the STEAM focus that we have. And so what the foundation just did actually now is part of our noise piece. We didn't have to make it up. We had one initiative, I think, in that category, but you brought us the rest of it. And that's what I love about partnering uh, with um, the foundation is you're helping us carry out our agenda uh, for Mavs Take Action. So I wanna say thank you for thank that. You. Thank you. Thank for you. That. So as we think about um, the time that, that I've spent with this group of people, amazing, um, the whole idea of how you make a difference in the community, how, how can this group take action? Because as I was listening to the presentations yesterday and just thinking about this group, and Alexander and I, the CEO, talk about it all the time, is that we know this is a great group of, of leaders who want to make a difference. And many of them will never see up close some of the, the people that we talk to and right. work with every day. So what actions, if they want to, if any of you in this room want to take an action, where would you tell them to start when they leave this conference saying, you know, I, I really do want to have an impact in the community? What, what I would, well, first of all, I would start internal. Uh, how many of you actually lead organizations? Almost every hand is up. How many of you actually have a, and I, and I will be so bold as to say robust, diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda that goes outside of your walls? So it is robust. Okay, so not as many hands went up. They're boating down here. Do we have a good one? Wait. <laughs> is it robust? Is it robust? <laughs> So, and so, and so that's where, that's where I will start. Uh, when I came to the Mavs, we had no focus at all uh, on diversity, equity, and inclusion. In fact, uh, most people didn't even understand the difference between diversity and inclusion, the difference between equality and equity. So we had a lot of work to do. Uh, not to mention that we had zero women in leadership and zero people of color uh, in leadership. And with 100, in 100 days, we had that change to 50% women and 50% uh, people of color at the table because we needed everybody. Like everybody uh, needed to be there. And so, and so that's where I started, setting a vision that said uh, we would set the global standard. 
And so it starts with the vision. It's, we put some values in place, character, respect, authenticity, fairness, teamwork, and safety, and character being the most important. And hopefully I'll get a chance to close on my character story Amen. and how I try to instill that uh, in our team members. Um, and then we said, okay, what's our agenda? And we laid out a holistic agenda. And so that would be the one thing I would say is to lay out a holistic agenda that has pillars to it that include employees, customers, suppliers, and philanthropy. And ours also spells crafts. So it's customers, it's our reputation as a business. We want to be known, yes, it's a great place to work, but we also want to be known as a great employer and we are making a difference in the community. And so what does that look like? What action can we take for people to really help us uh, obtain that uh, reputation? And then agenda for women, we have a we have a solid agenda for women to educate, elevate, empower uh, women. Thank you, James, for what you are doing. I, I love, I love uh, the story about how you got involved in that, really lifting up uh, women. So the agenda for women, talent, of course, uh, our recruiting strategies, how we develop people, retain people, and all that, and then our suppliers and sponsors, mm -hmm. okay? And then I think I mentioned at the beginning our, our, our customers, making sure our fan base our fan base who's sitting in that arena is reflective of who is also playing on that floor. Uh, so that's where I would start, to go back and say, what's my holistic, what's our holistic diversity, equity, inc and inclusion plan? How can we impact communities, employer, employees, sponsors, suppliers, et cetera? Robust, not just talent. A lot of us just focus on talent. That's how we've been able to make a difference. And so as part of that, we've been able to partner with the foundation. We've been able to, to help lead the Dallas Regional Chamber's efforts. You mm -hmm. and I led that together, together yeah. uh, to really put a focus on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion from an education standpoint, uh, from a, uh, building up a sustainable communities uh, standpoint, uh, looking at police reform and all of that. Uh, so really take that plan and take it to the next level and make sure it goes beyond just trying to diversify your employee base. No, and that's great. And I, I will share that story um, after the uh, George Floyd incident or murder, we shouldn't call it incident maybe. But, Public lynching. <laughs> but we, we were, the CEO of the chamber called and he's like, Hattie, I know you know diversity. What do you need to do? You know, people are getting all excited. And in the, you know, this knee jerk reaction at, for the community. And I said, okay, first thing is slow down, take a breath because you want this to be a movement of change, not just a moment of reaction. Right. And those are two totally different things. So we spent, uh, sent myself, the chair of the chamber that, at the time, John Olajide, um, we, we spent time with the CEO, just walking him through and talking to him in a lot of Saturday and Sunday meetings. Mm -hmm. But change has to start at the board level. And so we put in our board of directors the strategy of the organization. And this is why partnership is so important with a nonprofit. And then we said, you, in a pandemic where, where people are laying people off, and as the, the DEI practitioner, I said, and you need to hire a, a staff person to, to oversee this work because it's going to be so critical. And of course, the CEO is like, oh, we can't do that. But again, a great <laughs> partner said, I'll put up the first money for the position. So then we, I came back and said, well, in that case, we need two positions. Um, <laughs> but and then we funded two positions. And we funded two oh, positions. Oh, gosh, they thought we were crazy, but it's, 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 it's the right thing now. Because we needed one focused on kind of the diversity, equity, and inclusion piece, but that is separate from the community piece, just throwing out a few dollars in the community. DNI is a strategy. It is a corporate strategy. It is not community outreach and throwing a few dollars. And so... In this interview process, Hattie and I helped, helped uh, the folks understand that we needed both. And, in, and if we're making this recommendation and then we're on the call and they're thinking money, I said, in the Mavs, we'll fund both of these. Like, okay, well, let's do it. And we did it. Right. And the other side of that is since then, the CEO has raised a few million dollars based on this initiative because yes. people are wanting to make a difference in the community. Yes. And so I think when you think about as we... Um, start to bring this to a close, as you start to think about making a difference in the community. Where do you partner? How do you partner? You want trusted relationships. Uh, the tough part often I find being a part of groups like this is most of us, our trusted relationships are with people who look like us. 
So it's hard when you're trying to get into other areas and other communities when you don't spend time with those communities. And, and I know it's difficult in Dallas. We did a tour a few weeks ago of Southern Dallas County. And I was like, there are things here that I just never seen. I mean, it's, it's, because mm, you, you forget where you came from. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Honestly, yeah. you're not, you're not there all the time. Yeah. You're not there all the time. So you, you, I was, you, my boss just challenged me yesterday to raise $5 million. I think it is for a steam, um, uh, educational center to put in. I was dust. on the call. I said, oh Lord, she's going to be calling me. I was like, I got, <laughs> like, let like me. don't even call me Hattie. I got you. I sent her a text. I said, I heard him. I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You don't even have to call me, sister. I heard what he said, okay? Just <laughs> but the whole idea is to get kids in the community and expose them right there in that community to the STEAM education. Because it's hard when you got to go through, you know, get a bus, get them across town, do all of those things. And I will tell you, she talked about the STEAM Academy. We launched this foundation with a goal of raising $100 million January of 2020. As you can imagine, March happened and I literally was like, okay, we're done. And he said, no, I will see the money, but I need you to go help these students. So we, within 45 days, literally put together an online program, kids from DISD who did not even have the technology. We bought computers, literally stood out in the parking lot and handed them out with, and I called Sint, and I was like, I need hotspots, I need help. Because it's great to give them a computer, but if they can't get connected, you still have issues. So, the, the, so that's when people remember that I have 36 years at AT&T. Right. Okay, it's like, I don't need the basketball, I need hot spots. Hot spots. <laughs> <laughs> and so and I want you to close with your story, but, but what I will tell you is what this requires for us to make change in our communities now more than ever before. Yes. It is all of these stories that we've talked about, all of us working together uh, to move the communities forward because without that, we can all have all the wealth in the world, but it's not gonna make a difference for the greater good. Exactly, it's what we do with it. You get to close it, with your... What, okay, so I get to close with my uh, character story. Uh, when I, as I said, when I came to the Mavs, we did not have a set of values, uh, and that was pretty obvious. So uh, we laid out a set, well, it was obvious that, that we just didn't have one, okay? But now we do. And so uh, it's character, respect, authenticity, fairness, and teamwork and safety, both physical and emotional safety. And so we carry that uh, internally and outwardly. Uh, I told our team these, uh, these values will not just be on the walls because they are everywhere, along with our 100-day plan that we had. Everything was transparent. Uh, but they would also operate in the halls. Everything we would do would be based on a set of values that from this day forward, from the time I started three and a half years ago, we would be a values-based employer and character would be at the center of everything that we do. And one of the employees said, obviously, th this is not a place of character. This is not a place uh, that you know, does the right thing. This is not a place. And so they went on and on and on. And I said, no. And I gathered all the employees. And I said, every single one of us are people of character. We start that way. It's back to like your five-year-old story. And I told them that uh, story. And I'll tell you the story of. Uh, uh, my son, I have uh, four kids. Uh, they are all uh, adopted. Uh, that's how the Lord just blessed us to get these, um, these beautiful children uh, out of uh, the foster care system. And so the first one we adopted, uh, uh, Kenneth Anthony, when he was, uh, we adopted him at two and a half years old. And when he was about four years old, uh, he was in uh, daycare. And so they were having a preschool uh, baby picture contest at preschool. And so we didn't have any baby pictures of Anthony. We got him at two and a half years old. We had this one pitiful looking picture that they had taken of him. I thought it was a beautiful picture, but every time I'd show it to somebody who had kids, they could just see like the abuse and neglect all over him. But I, I thought it was cute because I, mean, I didn't have any kids. And so he's looking, I, I look at my husband who is helping him and they're, they're practicing this story that he's gonna tell at daycare the next day, this whole speech about when he was born and they have this baby picture. Well, we don't have any baby pictures of the kid because we met him at two years old. And so I look and it's actually a picture of my husband's nephew. And so I look at my husband, I, I look at my husband and I said, uh, you can't do that, that's, that's not him. And he's like, wife, I got it. Where are the dads in the room? 
Raise your hands, Dad, okay? <laughs> he said, uh, my job as his father is to give him self-esteem and self-confidence, and I'm not gonna have this boy being the only one without a baby picture. And you know, and back then, this is what, 26 years ago, okay? So, uh, you know, there was some stigma to adoption. He goes, no, my boy is gonna go in there with the story. And you know, you try to, not to argue in front of the kids, right? I'm like, dude, that's a lie. Like, you can't do that, right? And he said, wife, I got this. And so, and Anthony was just sitting there and he's getting his little story together. So the next day I go off to San Francisco to work and I come back home that evening and the trophy from the baby picture contest is on my kitchen table, okay? And it is, and it is as big as the kid, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I mean, this is a, the whole thing is a lie, it's a sham, right? And so, I look at my husband, he is rare back, he is so happy about this trophy. And so my son said, Mom, Mommy, Mommy, I won the contest. I'm like, I can see that. He said, and my husband's like, see, see, I know what I'm doing, see. And so he said, Mommy, you want to hear the story? I said, yeah, well, I, I kind of didn't, but I, I just smiled. He said, Mommy, I got up, he says, and I held up the picture, and I, I got to do like he did, right? He got up, he says, Mommy, I held up the picture, and I said, now my, my son's name is Kenneth Anthony. My nephew's name is Jalen, right? He said, Mommy, I held up the picture and I said, hi everybody, this is my cousin Jalen. <laughs> he said, and it's my cousin Jalen uh, because I have like a thousand cousins because I was born in a bathtub and I was abandoned when I was nine months old and they left me in there with my nine-year-old brother and the police took me and then they beat me up and fight. He, said, he was telling this whole story. He said, but then I got adopted. And now I have all these cousins, so I don't have a baby picture, but this is my cousin Jalen. He said, Mommy, everybody started crying, and they just gave me the trophy. <laughs> so, the moral of the story is, even at four years old, with his parents' permission to lie, and I will say his parents, because I didn't completely shut the thing down when I went to work, right? Even with his parents' permission to lie, that boy told the truth, and he did the right thing. And you know why he did? Because at four years old, it is in us to tell the truth and do the right thing. And that's what I have told our employees, and that's what I've tried to model. Let's be four years old, people with character, and do the right thing. Thank you. Aww. Thank you, guys. Thank you.